Hello and welcome to the 100th episode of Terry Talks Movies. Yep, it's my 100th video and I never knew what I wanted to do when I started this channel. But it's grown over time based on feedback from other people, based on me actually spending some time thinking about what I wanted to do. And so we've got to 100. We're getting up there on the subscribers as well, which is nice. And the views are really interesting there are a couple of videos that went crazy viral and got hundreds of thousands of views which is wow and there are others that got absolutely nothing so i'm still learning how to do this right but thank you very much for being a part of this thank you for subscribing if you do have if you haven't please consider it yeah i'm really enjoying the learning process of editing videos and of making movies as well it's just been a blast for the whole time I've done it. So thank you for being a part of this trip. It's uh, been great the support I've got from people and it makes it worthwhile when you know that the audience cares about what you do and are interested in what you say. So again, thank you very much. Uh, some interesting things have happened over the time I've been doing this. Sally and I went to Japan and I totally stuffed up the footage so it wasn't really usable for the channel. We put it on her channel and she did marvellous work making the Japan videos into something worth checking out and you should check out her channel. I'll link it at the end of this video. What do I want for the future of the channel? First off, I wanted to keep going. That's really the important thing. I was doing cinematic obituaries every three months on the channel. And I'm taking that to every six months because with the pandemic going on, it didn't feel right to kind of capitalize on the deaths of celebrities from COVID-19. So I'm doing one in the middle of this year and then at the end of this year. So I'm making it every six months instead of every three months. Those videos are incredibly popular. They're the ones that go viral and go crazy on the channel. But they're not what I want to be known for. I want to be known for doing reviews of movies that I like, old ones and sometimes new ones. And just really making that the brand. I also want to kind of document when the movie industry restarts after the lockdowns. I want to do a video about going to the cinema for the first time after I'm allowed to go to the cinema again. I think that's going to be fun because I've got a feeling that what's going to happen is I'm going to get the same joy of going to the cinema that I got when I was a child. And I want to first off experience that. And I also want to share that because it's going to be wild to do that. Um, I'm going to try to make sure it's a pretty big movie. There are a number of them coming up. Of course, there's Black Widow coming out. There's a James Bond movie. There's Eternals coming out and all sorts of other things. So I want to make it a big tentpole movie that I go to the cinema. I do the full popcorn experience. I might even see if I can go gold class where you get the big reclining seats and people come in and give you food and drink while you're watching the movie. We'll see how it goes anyway, but I'm looking forward to that. I want to make that part of what we do here. And I want to keep going and just doing different things. Uh, one of the next videos is going to be traveling because we've just had restrictions lifted here in Victoria where I live to make travel in the inter in the state itself available now so i can go off in the country and i can find some pretty locations to talk about movies while i've got a beautiful backdrop so i'm going to be doing that on thursday i don't know which movie i'm going to be talking about yet but i definitely want to do that i want to kind of get out of the house which has been the big problem and go and do that by the way for those who watched the video two videos ago i did have the covid 19 test and it came out negative so i'm kind of happy about that but I spent about four days where I couldn't go out of the house or the yard and it felt stupidly restrictive, which is kind of odd. Uh, I know a lot of people have gone through a lot worse, but the experience was kind of weird. Uh, I'm not going to document that any more than just saying that. So on to the subject of this video, which is comfort films. Movies that you go back to to make yourself relax and to enjoy you know they're always going to be a good experience and we go back to them because of nostalgia we go back to them because we like the story we go back to them because they're a reliable chill out kind of thing for us and everybody's got them uh, in the last video i said video before last i said i had about 20 of them and that's kind of an understatement i've got dozens and dozens of them but i picked five that i'm feeling the chill with right now and that are my go-to comfort movies 
So we've got a lot of comfort things in our lives. We have comfort food. We have comfort drink. We have comfort company. Yeah, I've got the big teddy bear with me today and um, he's going to be part of this video. Hang on, let me drag him in very slowly so he don't lose his cool sunglasses. Yeah, this guy. I'll just leave him half in the frame. So comfort movies. I've got five comfort movies to share with you that really comfort me for different reasons in each of the five films. But they are my comfort movies for right now. And of course, being who I am, I've got them on physical media because physical media is important. You own it, you don't just rent it, so when you stop paying your subscription, it doesn't all disappear. And also, Disney can't put a hairy ass on a mermaid if you've got an original copy of a movie. First movie, gonna hold it up to the camera and hopefully it'll go into focus. Planet of the Vampires, directed by Mario Bava. It's one of the movies that inspired Alien. It's beautiful because, um, apart from the fact that it's Mario Bava and Mario Bava can do no wrong. It's a good, solid, weirdly creepy horror science fiction hybrid movie made in Italy in the 1960s and done on a relatively small budget. Mario Bava used special effects in a really interesting way. He had miniatures hanging in the foreground so that it looked like they were much bigger than they are. He used what's called the Schuftam process to put people into sets they couldn't possibly be in on his budget. He was incredibly creative in the way he created the spaceships and also the alien planet on which the spaceship lands in this movie. Two spaceships land on an alien planet and one of the spaceships was lost the crew of the other one, led by the token American actor in the film, Barry Sullivan, go off to find the other spaceship and find that some of the people on that spaceship have been resurrected corpses. There's a whole bunch of stuff there. They find another alien spaceship, which has really large, giant aliens in it. That's a bit that inspired Ridley Scott's Alien. Uh, it, it really works. I think it punches so... No, I've got to stop saying punches above its weight. But it punches above its weight. It really does have a unique look. It uses primary colors really well. It uses fog effects and inventive set design to put across what it's trying to say. And even though the story does come back to a slightly hokey ending, it is one of those 1960s science fiction movies that kind of headed towards what we now know as classic science fiction. It really is worth checking out. The version I've got is the American International Productions version. The Italian version is slightly different. So the introduction to the Italian version is attached to the Blu-ray that I've got. Uh, it's an American Blu-ray release, so here's my advice for Australian people who are movie buffs. Go out, buy yourself a cheap multi-zone DVD and Blu-ray player. You're going to thank me for it. You'll be able to buy things overseas. It opens up a world of movies that you wouldn't otherwise see. You can pick up Italian movies with English subtitles, you can pick up English movies with Italian subtitles if you like. A lot of things are cheaper to buy overseas than they are in Australia, if they're available at all in Australia. My big advice is get a multi-zone Blu-ray player and maybe two or three of them, they're not that expensive. If you can afford it, get a couple of them because who knows for how long physical media is going to be retained by the people producing movies and you really want to be prepared for that cutoff date when they no longer make Blu-ray players. Just a bit of advice. Second comfort movie is one from my childhood. I saw it on my birthday when I was about 12 years old in the cinemas and it kicked ass then and I still love it now. It's not a perfect adventure action film but it's one that I have a nostalgic love for and it is from 1969, The Valley of Guanji with special effects by Ray Harryhausen. All you have to say to sell this movie is Cowboys versus Dinosaurs. Now I know they made that Cowboys versus Aliens, Cowboys and Aliens movie a while back with Harrison Ford and Daniel Craig, but that doesn't cut it quite as well as Cowboys versus Dinosaurs. And this one is the Cowboy versus Dinosaurs movie. In fact, it may well be one of the few. It stars James Franciscus, 
as a, a cowboy kind of guy. It's got Gila Goland, an Israeli actress, playing the mandatory love interest. It's got Richard Carlson, who was in a whole bunch of 1950s classic science fiction movies. Lawrence Naismith. And, of course, it has Guanji itself, a big Allosaurus, which the cowboys capture, bring to a Mexican town to show off, and shit goes down. That's all you need to know. We also get uh, a Neo Hippus, which is a Dawn horse, the precursor of modern horses. We get a little one of those. It's very, very cute. We get a pterodactyl, and we get another couple of dinosaurs as well. It's a lot of fun. And the interesting thing that when I watch this film, yes, it's got stop motion dinosaurs in it, and stop motion doesn't play as well as CG these days. But when I'm watching the Valley of Guanji, and the dinosaurs come on board, and the cowboys start chasing them and trying to spear them and lasso them and all those kind of things. I'm there. I'm totally in the moment. I believe it while I'm watching that movie. It's the, one of the joys of that nostalgia factor. The fact that when I'm watching it, I believe it. And later on, yeah, I can analyse it and I can see where things worked and where things didn't work. But right at the time that movie is playing, the magic is still there for me. And I just love that. It's such a rich and perpetual experience. Every time I watch it, I get the same thing. I get the same suspension of disbelief. And you can't buy that for money. It's just something that has to happen with a certain movie at a certain time of your life. The third movie is an Australian movie from 2019. It's a romantic comedy which says a lot about Australian culture. It says a lot about Australian inclusiveness. It says a lot about reconciliation with First Nations Australians. And it's also beautifully shot and it has a luminously wonderful star. It is Top End Wedding. Now, if you haven't seen this film, you should definitely check it out. It stars Miranda Tapsell as uh, a lawyer living in Adelaide who decides to marry her boyfriend, played by Gwilym Lee. And they go back to Darwin, where she's from, and decide to have their wedding there. Unfortunately, her mother goes missing. And so, with the help of her father and her boss and a few other people, they go searching through the Northern Territory of Australia, looking for Lauren's mum, until they find her, and then she has a beautiful wedding on the Tiwi Islands, and everyone lives happily ever after. But it's that journey. It's that inclusiveness, the multiculturalism of it, the beautiful evocation of various indigenous cultures in Australia. It has a lot to say about inclusiveness, about the richness of our First Nations cultures, which is underappreciated in Australia, and in particular in Australian movies. And Miranda Tapsell is a wonderful star in that film. It's a comfort film. It's un unashamedly romantic. It's funny, it's witty, and it's wise. And if you haven't seen Top End Wedding, you should definitely check it out. It's just a joy to watch. If it turns up on a streaming service somewhere else in the world, give it a go, and I think you'll learn a lot about this country. Number four is a movie that I didn't actually watch for a long time because I saw a bad review of it. It's a movie that was reviewed by the famous movie reviewer and critic, Pauline Kael. And she said that the guy who made it didn't really understand American musicals and made a botched job of doing a French version of American musical. But then I gave it a go and I fell in love with the movie. It is Jacques Demy's La Demoiselles de Rochefort. It's a joyous musical. It stars Francois Dorliac and Catherine Deneuve playing a pair of twins. Their actual real life sisters are uh, unfortunately Francois Dorliac died in a car accident. Of course, Catherine Deneuve has gone on to have a long and successful career in cinema. Uh, this is just a joyous musical. It has a bunch of other stars in it. George Chakiris, who was in West Side Story. Danielle Darrieux, who is one of the goddesses of French cinema. And Michelle Piccoli as well. It's set in the town of Rochefort on the coast of France. It's joyously beautiful to look at. The singing and the dancing is marvellous. The first scene set on a suspension bridge just brings you into the world of this movie. It's got wonderful music by Michel Legrand. The whole thing is wonderfully beautiful and I really, really love it. 
Uh, I've got the soundtrack as well. I watch it every couple of years. It drives Sally nuts that I watch this movie so much. But uh, for me, it's a comfort film. It's just one of those movies when you're feeling a bit low and down and you think the world is going to hell. Put on The Young Girls of Rochefort and it's a mood lifter for me. It's an antidepressant to beat all antidepressants. And I love it for that reason. It's just a lot of fun. And it's got a little bit of a bonus there because it's got Gene Kelly singing and dancing as well. And even though he is a kind of secondary character in it, him singing and dancing around the pastel painted town of Rochefort really, really works. It's a lovely film. And if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. Then when you have, for a weepy date night movie, you can have a look at The Umbrellas of Cherbourg, which was Jacques Demy's previous musical. And I probably should do a video about that sometime in the future. Let me know if you want me to. But Le Demoiselles de Rochefort, it's a definite recommend from me. It is a lovely comfort movie. And the final one. Now, I'm not the sort of guy who likes sports movies. Really, I can take them or leave them. They're not my kind of thing. But this is one of my favourite comfort movies. And it's a sports movie as well. It's one of the two golf movies ever nominated for an Academy Award. The first one was Pat and Mike, starring Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. And this one was nominated for an Oscar for Best Song. And it is from 1967. Banning. Starring Robert Wagner, Jill St. John, Angela Coma, and Gene Hackman. Now, as I said, I'm not a big sports movie guy, but I like this one. Robert Wagner plays Mike Banning, a former professional golfer who was thrown out of the circuit for cheating, who needs to raise some money to pay off a debt that a friend of his owes. He starts working at a country club in Arizona as a golf pro and meets various people, including Jules and John playing a rich girl and Anjanette Coma, who works for the golf club as well. And they, you get a lot of soap opery plot things in there. He's got an enemy played by Guy Stockwell. James Farentino is in there as well. And this movie kind of grabs me because I like Johnny Mandel's music in it. The Eyes of Love, the song that was nominated for an Oscar, is kind of cool as well. It very much gives us the vibe of the movie. It's got that kind of weird, rich people, 1960s Hollywood look about it, which I really appreciate. It's got some really well done golf scenes, and there's a ton of golf movies out there. There's King Cup, there's The Legend of Bag of Vance, there's Caddyshack 1 and 2, there's also Happy Gilmore, which I've never seen because it's an Adam Sandler comedy and I don't go there. But this one really works for me. It's just got that vibe about it where you know it's not a serious movie, it's a drama, it's not a comedy, but it's got a few interesting character actors in there. You've got Mike Killen playing a guy called Kaliel, who the, to whom the debt is owed, and he has a couple of really nice scenes in there, so it's nice to see some character actors in there. Plus you get Gene Hackman playing a washed up golf pro. And the interesting thing is that Gene Hackman's about the same age as Robert Wagner, but he's playing a guy 20 years older. And Gene Hackman was born looking 45 years old. But he works in it, he gives it a good shot in there. This is well before Gene Hackman became famous with things like The French Connection and The Poseidon Adventure and all those movies that got him into the A grade of Hollywood cinema. But I like it for so many different reasons. The music, the mise-en-scene, the macho maleness of it in some places. The fact that it's got beautiful women in it. It's just a comfort film because it's a movie that I saw first, I think, on late night television. And it's a very typical Robert Wagner role of the time, just before he made one of my all-time favourite TV series, It Takes a Thief. And it works for me. Uh, there's no explaining it. There's no real rationale for me loving this film as much as I do. It got, finally it got a DVD release a couple of years ago here in Australia, Mad Men Films, who put out some really interesting stuff. They do anime, they do... Um, horror films, they do all sorts of stuff. Mad Men films are really putting out some weird and wild content. And they put Banning out for no known reason. But unfortunately it is in um, Academy ratio rather than widescreen, which is a bit of a flaw in it. But it's better to have Academy ratio version of a movie than not to have it at all. 
And if it ever comes out on Blu-ray anywhere in the world, I'll probably pick up a copy of it. All props to Mad Men Films for putting out a legit copy. Because for years, all you could get were VHS rips and illegal downloads of that kind. And the quality was really crap. But this time, we've got a decent copy of it. And I'm kind of happy about that as well. Like I said, it's a comfort film. It's a movie I like. If you watch it, you'll probably be entertained by it. But you may not have the same connection with it that I do. So there are my five comfort films at the moment. Thank you very much for watching. Um, again, if you'd like to, please consider subscribing. Let me know what your comfort movies are. I know some of you like Star Wars and they're your comfort movies, all those Star Wars movies. But I don't need to know that. Um, anything else you've got, anything off the wall and unusual you've got as a comfort film, let me know in the comments what that is because I'd be really interested to see which films other people engage with at that level because it is a, a slightly unusual headspace it's something that the studios can't really monetize because it's an intensely personal thing but i love comfort films i love having comfort films and i love the fact that we have the technology to own copies of our comfort films and to enjoy them whenever and almost wherever we like to so take care of yourself stay safe keep watching good movies keep watching bad movies i'll be back soon with something else on the road next time in the meantime i'll catch you later <laughs>